Let us pray. Gracious God, may we, from your word and from this story of Samson and Delilah and the story before him of his life, may we learn something that we need to take with us. Help us open our hearts, open our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, today's the 12th. Yep, today's the 12th. On September 10th was our son's 32nd birthday. I can tell you something. We did not get him for his birthday this year. We did not get him any superhero action figures. <laughs> but in the day, back in the day, that was the regular gift. These, these action figures, which were I mean, the truth is they were so cool, a lot of figures I'd never heard of, you know, the ones from like the Marvel comics or the, the, um, you, the and all these movies now. And so, yes, we're not getting him those gifts, but our son and our daughter, they both are, they regularly go see all these Marvel movies, and a lot of us do too, these superhero movies, you know, like Iron Man and Batman. And one thing we know one thing we know from those movies and from the more detailed comics is that the superheroes, they're not depicted, you know, Batman and Iron Man, Iron Man are not depicted as perfect. They're often complicated people with these backstories, and they have not led perfect lives that bring them up to this moment. And so I did a little research on my own. I went, looked for, you know, problematic stories about superheroes, and I found this one that said, 10 worst things superheroes have done. And they're really bad. And in that way, Samson fits right in, the original, basically the biblical kind of superhero. He fits right in, but actually I'd say Samson, he's worse, actually a lot worse. So what would you say what would you say about if you, you know, you didn't know anything about this person, this superhero, who for starters, this won't sound so bad, he yelled at his parents. He ordered his parents around, at, was, and he was looking for a wife. <clears throat> he saw a Philistine woman and um, he, he, that he, who he wanted as, as his wife, and his parents were with him, and his dad, twice he yelled at him, now get her for me. So much for honor thy mother and father. What would you say about a superhero who ate things he was commanded by his a life vow that his mom had made on his behalf? He was not supposed. He's eating things he is not supposed to eat. Really, well, I'll tell you one of the, the thing he eats in this earlier story. He, after he kills a lion, showing his great strength. He ate honey, this is, well, I'll just say it. He ate honey that it was in the carcass that bees had formed in the carcass of the dead lion. So much for the kosher dietary laws. What would you say about a superhero who at his own wedding and around his wedding, the timing's slightly unclear, he plays a trick, he... At his wedding, he plays a trick, sort of. He asks this riddle, it's a silly riddle, self-indulgent riddle of his guest, the Philistine guest, and he, he, asks, he insists that everybody play and that everybody answer the riddle that, or try to answer the riddle, and his, if they get the answer right, he's going to give them some clothing. Okay? Clothing if they get the right answer. And his wife... Actually, they put pressure on her, and she gives some of the people the answer. And, and, and temper problems this guy had. He's so mad, he basically divorces his wife. And he goes, and he goes off, and he kills some other people and takes their clothing, and that's how he pays off his, his, his bet. Appalling to the Philistines and appalling to anyone. What would you say about a superhero who, when he's not allowed to see his now ex-wife, he gets so mad, he's so angry, that he, he takes a 300 foxes and he ties burning twigs 
to their tails, and he sends them scurrying around out in the fields so that they burn all the crops of the Philistines. Chaos. Or what would you say about a superhero who then, wildly, in this sort of wild scene, you can only imagine it, he takes a, 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 a jawbone of a, of a donkey and he kills men. And I poured over this time and again. Knew it by heart. How did Samson, in this story, the truth is he's in a terrible place. He's blinded, he's lost all his strength, he's forced to be a slave and to perform for his hated rivals, the Philistines. But in reality, it really shouldn't be all that surprising that Samson ended up this way, given how he conducted his life. He angered so many people with his dangerous and reckless behavior and disrespectful and selfish and vengeful and egotistical and wildly uncontrollable guy, his behavior. And because of all of that, the Philistines were just waiting for an opportunity to get back at him, and they found it. The Bible does not shy away from reality. In this reality, in this story, one of the realities is that we live in a world of consequences, and sadly for Samson, there was payback. Now, revenge, of course, is a dangerous game, and today, Samson gets his revenge. He tears down the walls when his hair grows back, and we, of course, wonder, was, it the, was the hair really the, his strength, or was it God? And the Bible pretty clearly implies that it was God. But regardless, this is a troubling story, and yet kids for generations, including me, and adults have been fascinated by this story. So what we, I think, need to ask, are we supposed to take from this story? Andrea lifted up something important about not just being physical strength, uh, spiritual strength. What else can we take from this story? Or for one thing, it's a reminder that when you open up your Bibles, do not expect perfect people. When Samson, while he may be among the worst behaved people in the Bible, plenty of other greats in the Bible did some pretty disturbing things. And we're learning about that in our Bible series on the great characters of the Bible. I'd argue, in fact, that if the Bible, if the Bible was full of, if it was full of only wonderful people who only did wonderful things, not only would that be boring, but would also be ridiculously unrealistic given how we see our world. And the Bible insists on being realistic about the world and about us. In fact, if everyone in the Bible was so wonderful, we would miss perhaps, I might argue, the main point of the Bible, which is that none of us is perfect. We all have flaws, sins, and because of that, we need God. Now, while there is much more that we could say about the Samson story today, lessons, especially about what not to do, how not to behave, but maybe also something positive, how at the end, Samson finally turns to God, really, for the first time in his life. But there's, I think, something even more basic that we can find here. And that is that you don't have to be a superhero to serve God. You do not have to have superhero strength to make a difference in God's creation. Sometimes, and we can forget this, sometimes being a faithful person, being a faithful Christian, leading a faithful Christian life, it can be simpler, more down-to-earth than we might think. Very basic stuff. Stuff I think we all know, and we all don't always do necessarily. I know I don't. Basic stuff, being respectful of others, tending to our families, 
keeping promises, not losing our tempers when those around us are, and in that way being a calming force, helping others who don't maybe have as much as we do or maybe need a lift up. And on this day, it especially makes me think of the humble, heroic work of our first responders, of course during the pandemic, but 20 years ago as well on 9-11. Basic work, life-saving work, heroic work, done by regular human beings. There are many ways that we can make a difference in the world. Each of us working with God, we can work with God to figure out our own special way <laughs> or ways to do it. But remember this. God is not looking for perfect superhuman people. God is looking for you and me. And our strength, each of our strengths, it's sufficient. Amen.